Let's do a quick review of government intervention in markets. So the reasons for the forms of and the consequences of government intervention in markets. So what are the reasons for government intervention in markets? Well, basically, governments intervene or interfere in markets to influence market outcomes in order to, they have a number of objectives and a lot, several of these objectives could apply for the same sort of intervention. So governments interfere in markets in order to earn government revenue by taxing uh, products in markets. Governments can earn tax revenue so that the government can afford to pay for all of the services that it provides. Sometimes governments interfere in markets in order to support firms um, by interfering in order to raise the price or protect the income of um, firms or um, producers. Sometimes governments interfere in order to support households on low incomes. If the product is a necessity and it's too expensive, the government can interfere in the market by subsidizing the product or maybe setting a price ceiling to support households on low incomes. Sometimes governments interfere in markets in order to influence the level of production. Maybe this is a harmful product that is overproduced. Okay, so the government decides to tax the product in order to discourage um, overproduction. Uh, governments can also interfere in order to influence the level of consumption. Maybe it's a harmful product that's being overconsumed, like cigarettes, for example. So the government might interfere in order to influence the level of consumption. Maybe it's a beneficial product that's being underconsumed. So the government might interfere in the market in order to encourage more consumption by maybe subsidizing the product. Governments sometimes interfere to correct market failure. Markets sometimes lead to the overallocation or the underallocation of resources. And this leads to market failure. The market fails to achieve allocative efficiency. So governments can interfere in order to correct market failure when it occurs. Sometimes government interfere in markets to promote equity. Maybe the outcome of the free market is not necessarily fair for people on low incomes or the poorer households. So sometimes governments interfere to promote equity. These are the various reasons for government intervention in markets. So what are the main forms of government intervention in markets that you have to study? In um, our IB economic syllabus, there are four main forms. The first one is price controls using price ceilings known as maximum prices or price floors known as minimum prices. What price controls do is that they artificially fix the price of the good or service above equilibrium in the case of price floors or below equilibrium in the case of price ceilings. What they do is they keep the price of that good or service artificially fixed so the government is controlling the price of that good or service. Um, the second type is indirect taxes and subsidies. We group them together because they affect the costs of production incurred by the producers of the good or service and so alter the supply of the product. Indirect taxes will actually raise the costs of production incurred by the producers and so they will lead to a decrease in supply while subsidies will have the opposite effect. They lower the costs of production incurred by the producers and so they lead to an increase in supply. Um, the third form is direct provision of those goods or services. So the government will actually step in and actually produce and provide the good or service itself. This is another form of government intervention in the market. The fourth and last type of, of government intervention in the market is command and control regulation and legislation. Governments create laws, policies, and regulations to influence either the production or the consumption of the good or service, such as having a legal age, for example, um, below which you can't purchase alcohol or cigarettes, or having laws and policies as to where people can smoke. They can't smoke, for example, in indoor areas they have to smoke in outdoor areas so command and control regulation and legislation is also a form of government intervention in markets so when it comes to government intervention in markets you are also required to know the consequences of this intervention for the markets involved and for all stakeholders involved you're also required to show diagrams that show the possible effects on these markets and stakeholders. There are four diagrams you need to be familiar with. The price ceiling or maximum price diagram, a price floor or minimum price diagram, the indirect tax diagram, and the subsidy diagram. And this is what I'm going to review in the next few slides. 
So let's start with the diagram for price ceilings, which are also known as maximum prices. Basically, um, a price ceiling is a maximum price that is set when the equilibrium price of that product is too high. So the government legislates that the price of the product cannot be higher than this ceiling. Okay, so it's often used to make the good or service more affordable for consumers when the free market equilibrium is too high. Um, price ceilings often create shortages because quantity demanded um, ends up being greater than quantity supplied. As you can see here, QD is greater than QS. There's a shortage um, at the maximum price. And this can encourage the rise of black markets to supply the product through unofficial channels. Now, the government has to then take some action to respond to this shortage. So maybe it will do this through direct provision of the good or service, which entails an opportunity cost because to directly provide the good or service, the government is um, paying money that is raised from tax revenue. So um, there's an opportunity cost because tax revenues could be used elsewhere. Uh, real world examples of price ceilings include rent controls, which are designed to make housing more affordable, uh, price controls on staples like food and energy products, as well as prescription drugs to make these essentials more affordable to consumers. As you can see here, the maximum price or the price ceiling is below equilibrium. Okay. And, um, the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied. It leads to a shortage that the market cannot clear by itself because the market is not free. There is a price control set by the government. The next diagram we're going to review is the diagram for price floors, also known as minimum prices. So minimum prices are often used to protect the income or the revenue of the producers of this good or service when the free market equilibrium is too low. So you can see here the free market equilibrium is too low, so the government legislates that there's a minimum price, a price floor that is above equilibrium. Price floors will create surpluses because at this price floor, quantity supplied is greater than quantity demanded. So it will lead to there being a surplus at this minimum price. The government has to then take some action to respond to this surplus. So the government might have to buy up the surplus, which will increase the demand for the good or service. Again, the government is using tax revenue to do this, which entails an opportunity cost. Some real world examples of price floors include minimum wages. Minimum wages are a price floor designed to protect the incomes of unskilled workers. Um, there are also price floors that are used on some agricultural products to protect the incomes of farmers. The next diagram for government intervention you need to be familiar with is the diagram for indirect taxes. Now, indirect taxes are taxes that are imposed on expenditure on goods and services. What they do is they raise the costs of production for producers and they cause, hence, they cause a decrease in supply. As you can see, the supply curve shifts from S to S plus tax. It shifts to the left. Now, as you can see in the diagram, certain labels you need to be familiar with. After the tax is imposed and the supply curve shifts to the left, PC becomes the price the consumer pays. PC is right here. I highlighted it in the diagram. PP becomes the price the producer receives. Now, PP is obviously lower than PC because the difference between PC and PP is the tax per unit. It is the vertical distance between the two supply curves here. This vertical distance here is the tax per unit. It's the difference between the price the consumer pays and the price the producer receives. Q1 is the quantity bought and sold after the imposition of the tax. If you take PC minus PP and you multiply that by Q1, it will give you the total tax revenue for the government, which I shaded in green. It's the green box that is shaded here. So it's the price the consumer pays minus the price the producer receives, that distance multiplied by Q1, the quantity bought and sold after imposing your tax, this will give you the total tax revenue. As you can see from the diagram, consumers will pay a higher price, so an indirect tax will discourage consumption. Producers will receive a lower price, which means an indirect tax will also discourage production. Indirect taxation may thus harm employment in that industry, which is not so good for the workers in that industry. Okay, So if the government puts an indirect tax on cigarettes, consumers will pay a higher price, so that will discourage consumption of cigarettes. Producers will receive a lower price, which discourages production, and this may harm employment in the tobacco industry. The government will collect tax revenue 
and this may correct market failure related to overproduction, overconsumption of the product being taxed, which is why you see it in markets like the cigarette market, alcohol market, or gambling. The last form of government intervention you need to be able to represent diagrammatically is subsidies. Subsidies are basically the opposite of indirect taxes. A subsidy is a grant that is given to producers to cover parts of their costs of production. What they do is they lower the cost of production for producers and so cause an increase in supply. You see, once a subsidy is granted, the supply curve shifts from S to S plus subsidy. It's a shift to the right. Now, here, PC is the price the consumer pays, while PP on the diagram is the price the producer receives. You can see that the producer receives a higher price than what the consumer pays. PP minus PC is the subsidy per unit. It is the vertical distance, the vertical distance between the two supply curves. That's the subsidy per unit, PP minus PC. Q1 is the total quantity bought and sold after granting a subsidy. Um, PP minus PC, which is the subsidy per unit, when you multiply that by Q1, that will give you the total cost of the subsidy to the government. So let's see the effect on the different stakeholders. Consumers will pay a lower price. So in, in, in essence, a subsidy will encourage consumption. Producers will receive a higher price than before granting the subsidy. So in essence, a subsidy encourages production. The subsidy may actually create more jobs in the industry, which is good for workers in that industry being subsidized. The government pays the cost of the subsidy, however, which may anger taxpayers. So the government is worse off and taxpayers are worse off. A subsidy may be used to correct, may correct any market failure related to the underproduction or the underconsumption of the product being subsidized. That's why you see subsidies subsidies being granted to industries like the education industry, healthcare industries, vaccines, and so on. And this is to encourage consumption and encourage production. I hope you found this review of the reasons for types of and the diagrams for government intervention, as well as the consequences for the various stakeholders. I hope you found this review useful. Please contact me if you have any questions.